Four men are sentenced to death for the gang rape of a woman in a case that galvanized India. But while many say justice has been done, are Indian women any better off? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Jane Dutton. It was a case that put the status of Indian woman into sharp focus. The gang rape of a young woman on a New Delhi bus so brutally assaulted that she died from her injuries. The four men were found guilty and sentenced to hang. Their lawyers say they are appealing. Our correspondent Nidhi Dutt has been following the case and has the latest from New Delhi. For months, people across India have demanded the death penalty for a heinous crime that stirred the nation's conscience. And today they got what they asked for. The four men found guilty of raping and murdering a 23-year-old woman in New Delhi in December last year have been given the strongest punishment possible in the Indian legal system. They have been sentenced to death. This will create fear in their minds. One would think twice and wonder about the consequences before doing anything. Every day we hear about incidents of rape and murder all over. Now, all of this will stop. As this high-profile case has proceeded through the courts, many Indians have directed their anger at the lawyers defending the perpetrators of the crime. One of the defense attorneys says Friday's sentence is a result of widespread media pressure. When the accused arrived here from jail, they were in tears. They were aware they would receive this sentence. I asked them why they were crying. They said, we know we'll be hanged. But many say it will take more than just cases like this to change mindsets across the country. More than the legal system, I feel we should start this change in individual homes. We should teach our children, make them morally aware, teach them moral duties, teach them that these things are not right and one shouldn't do these things. If these things are taught at home, then I think we will start seeing the results. The four men are expected to appeal their sentences in higher courts. The victim's family is ready for a long fight. Yes, this fight will go on till the day they are hanged. That is the day we will get final justice and peace of mind. This sentence has been well received across India, but it may be some time before the punishment is carried out. For months, women's rights and sexual violence have dominated national debate and many people here hope that this case will lead to permanent social, cultural and legal changes. Nidhi Dutt for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests now from New Delhi, Suhas Chakma. He's director of the Asian Centre for Human Rights. From London, Dr. Aisha Gill is a reader in criminology at the University of Roehampton. She's also an expert on violence against women. And joining us on Skype from New Delhi is Tiar Kakar, former police commissioner in the capital. Welcome, all three of you. Thank you very much for joining us. Tiar Kakar, let me start off with you. What is your response to the fact that the four accused are heading to the gallows, sentenced to hang? Well, the judgment has been pronounced today, sentencing four of them to death. And a juvenile earlier was given the maximum sentence under that act, that is three years. But this is not the end of the road. We have a system where this has to be confirmed. The sentence of death has to be confirmed by the higher court. Then they go in appeal to one court and the second Supreme Court. They also have uh, the right to uh, seek clemency of the president. All this takes time. But the fact is that one thing has been established, that if you indulge in these sort of crime, gruesome crimes, you will get maximum sentence. Because after, after this, uh, the Nirbhaya's case, that is this girl's case, we have had, we, the government was forced by the public pressure to amend the crime amend this particular act which we call the criminal law amendment act where more harsher punishments have been provided now even for striking even for voying and and other things okay. we hope 
Okay, the let me bring in Suhas, if you don't mind. How is this reverberating on the streets of New Delhi, the sentence? And do you think, from a human rights point of view, this is the correct sentence? No, I think, I mean, the issue is in terms of having impact, whether this will reduce crime against women in India. I think this is not going to have any effect. Each year, if you look at the records of the National Crime Records Bureau of the Ministry of Home Affairs, about 526 persons are given that sentence. Now, if you add one more, what difference it makes? It makes no difference. So I think as far as this case is concerned, whatever impact it had to have, it already had in terms of amendment of the Criminal Law Amendment Act in 2013. But out there itself, the government actually shied away from reforming the entire system where the actual women are subjected to various kind of crimes, including at times by the security forces. And so I do not think, I mean, this is going to change or this is going to have a fundamental effect. I think the last person who was hanged for dead, uh, rape and death was Dhananjay Chitaji in Kolkata in 2004. But if you look at the statistics today, West Bengal uh, has the maximum number of violence against women in India in the last 2000, in, in 2000. 12. So what kind of impact that penalty or the hanging of that person had in West Bengal? No effect whatsoever. So I don't think this, there are a number of people who are welcoming it. I think it's expected, but this is not going to change the situation. Okay, Aisha, as a criminologist, do you believe that justice has been fairly delivered here? I think the death penalty uh, in using, using the death penalty to bring about redress in relation to rape cases is problematic. Now, I know the family of Nabaya today, this, uh, this afternoon, did state that they were happy with the verdict and the, the sentence and that they believe that justice has been done. Now, I, I think this is really, really problematic and I don't, I don't think it offers a way forward uh, in terms of addressing sexual violence and violence against women uh, across India and anywhere else in the world. I, one of the things that's evident from this case is that public calls for the death penalty are not actually unusual in relation to heinous crimes that are committed. Um, often when uh, such crimes are like this in particular, galvanizes a nation, puts a spotlight on, the, on this particular issue, what it does is that it kind of assumes that the death penalty in some way will be the ultimate embodiment of, of justice and therefore it, it will act as an, a deterrent. I, I, I don't think it will and I don't think, I mean there's research that's done by criminologists um, in a number of countries including the United States of Ameri America where the death penalty doesn't actually act as an adequate deterrent in terms of violence against women and sexual violence. Okay, let me, Basically let me put what it, that... What, no, if I may say this, what it, what it has done, I think it, it, this, this verdict and this sentence is kind of a reaction to the collective anger and, and, and it avoids dealing with the real challenge of how do we address violence against women across Indian society, more broadly beyond India. Okay, let me bring in Teor Kaka then. I mean, we've got the two guests there saying that the death penalty is not going to make any difference whatsoever. You see, there are two schools of thought always. Uh, one, perhaps the probably feel that death sentence is no deterrent for uh, stopping any type of crime, including the murder per se. It's, it's, uh, but then there's another school of thought to say that there has to be deterrence. And in this case, the deterrence has been now there are two things one is committing rape the other is committing rape and murdering the 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 women in this case both the things have taken place a gruesome murder by six people as a matter of fact of a woman which and and violence and then she died now it is because she died therefore the the death sentence has been awarded Otherwise, it could have been just the life sentence because that is the provision. So please, let's let's separate these two. Now, whether this will act as a deterrent or not is 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 a question which the sociologists and the people in general have to have to see. Okay, but let's even talk. Countries like America and like other other Western countries and some of the 
the, this sent, death sentence is there on the card and it is awarded. But that does not mean that the crime has stopped elsewhere. It is only to deter people from committing such heinous crimes. Let's look at uh, some of the impact that this case has had on India. India's parliament passed a set of new laws in March aimed at protecting women from sexual assault. The laws expand on the definition of rape, stating that the absence of physical struggle doesn't equal consent. Stalking is now illegal. It's considered a form of intimidation. Voyeurism is defined as spying on a nude woman or circulating her pictures without her consent. Acid attacks and the forced stripping of women, both fairly common in India, are specified as crimes. On top of the laws, the government has introduced a fast-track court system to speed up the prosecution of accused rapists. Tiar Kaka, but you can still rape your wife and security forces have legal immunity for sexual violence. How come? Look, most of the uh, crime of rape in this country takes place and is committed by people who are known to the victim. They could be a neighbor, an uncle, and uh, some cousin, brother, somebody else, you see. That is one thing. And the, the other is committing rape of a, of, a, of a woman with whom you have no relationship at all. Now, these, these, all these things have been brought under one Criminal Law Amendment Act, and including uh, rape of your own wife is now, now punishable, you see. Uh, how much effect it will have is very difficult to say now because the law has been amended only in March. All right, let me but ask Aisha people, about this. It some of the people... Excuse me, John really Virginia. Aisha, do you think any of this is going to make any difference at all? Have you seen a change already? Well, I, I, I mean, it I has created a significant debate across India uh, uh, in terms of how to address violence against women, and particularly sexual violence. But I think there's a long way to go. I mean, even post-December, there have been horrific cases that have been reported across India, from Haryana uh, to, from, to, to Delhi to, to, to Mumbai most recently, in terms of a journalist, a young journalist being gang-raped. I think there's a long way to go, and, uh, and this case also has, you know, raised questions about how does the state respond to violence against women, sexual violence that's perpetrated against Dalit women, that's perpetrated by police officers who are in positions of pa power, perpetrated by, by, by members giants. of government. Yes, absolutely, and and I think we need to really, really address these kind of issues alongside, you know, creating justice and safety and access to support service for, for those who are victims of this violence. I think, you know, what, what, has, what this case has highlighted is that why are we not talking about the violence against women, sexual violence of women uh, amongst the, the Dalit communities who have been uh, abused and um, attacked for many, many years, yet their cases don't seem to get the same level of profile and media attention and debate uh, as the same way as this tragic case has. Suhas, do you think there is uh, a case here for poor women that they get overlooked, for migrants that they're not taken as seriously as, as possibly the student was? No, I think we need to look at the entire social structure in the country. I mean, for thousands of years under the caste system, the Dalit women, women belonging to the lower caste, we are basically treated as properties by the upper caste. In one hand, they practice untouchability, so you can't touch anybody belonging to the Sudra community. But on the other hand, raping their women has been the practice for a long time. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is the when the Criminal Law Amendment Act was brought in, the Justice Burma Committee has specifically recommended that the law providing immunity through prior sanction with respect to the armed forces, which is like the central government paramilitary forces and the army, ought to be amended. And that has not been amended. And today we have a situation where the government of India is engaged in at least in 21 states in armed conflict, 13 Naxalite states, 7 in the northeast, and Jammu and Kashmir. Now, in this court itself, which sentenced these four people to death today, in the last 23 cases, only in three cases, the court has convicted. In 20 cases, 
all of them we are acquitted by this judge. Now there is a problem when 20 acquittal takes place and it takes place because the prosecution the investigation is not proper, police can be bought, the, the, the forensic evidence is not appropriate, and there is no system for the women. And at the end of the day, you have a judicial system where you have about 30 million cases pending. Now somebody who earns less than a dollar a day, do you expect that guy or that family to follow up the cases in the courts for 20 years to prosecute somebody? Obviously, so are you it saying that possible. this all looks in good on cases, paper? Excuse me interrupting you. Does this all look good on paper? paper but actually on the ground it's not going to make any difference at all no not at all i think the only way the government could make changes is if the government creates a victims funds where the victims are given adequate financial resources to hire the best in the business in terms of prosecution so that they can hire their own lawyers rather than relying on the public prosecutors who do not do any work at the end of the day if the victims do not have any support to actually follow up the cases in the court and they are paid for it. There is no way you can have actually a prosecution of the culprits. And that's why in this court in Sakhet today, out of the 23 judgments, 20 cases he has acquitted. So it must be a question which should be raised with the administration. So all these are basically on papers. Tomorrow another issue will come up and everybody will forget about it. Tiar Kakami, what is your response? They both guests are attacking the justice system. They're saying, again, it's not enough. He raised the issue of the Dalit women and the women in, in the villages. Well, I, 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 I agree to an extent that, yes, these crimes are being committed. The question is, as for the Nexels and the, and the Northeast, are all the, a large number of false cases to demoralize the police are lodged by these people. They are basically false cases. Now, the question of that this won't act as a deterrent or this particular uh, trial court has earlier acquitted 20 people because there was not an FA. We, we work on the Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence, which means that let 99 go uh, guilty, go unpunished, but let not a single innocent man be hanged. This is because if the evidence is not total, then they are, then they are most of them are acquitted. But that does not mean that we will not have a strict, strict law. That doesn't mean that we will. And he's also raised that people do not have the money to, to fight their cases. Okay. All cases are government cases. Case, any, any crime committed against any member of the society. Okay, but clearly a, it's not working it's and, and it's not enough. I mean, for women in India, us. it is one of the most dangerous countries in the world. <laughs> Why do you have this problem in India? Well, I think the problem of um, um, if I if I say that you know the crime of rape is perhaps committed as much in in, in America as, as as in India, I am please go. That doesn't make it any more acceptable. Reported crime, reported. Don't please do not take the figure of the of the cases in America which reach the court. A lot of cases. Almost 70 percent of the cases in America of rape or, or molestations are end up somewhere from the reporting to the courts. Okay, we're talking about India it here now. So I'm going to bring in Suhas, who's got some comments to make about what you've been saying, Suhas. No, you know, I mean, on the on 5th of May of this year, about five one five-year-old girl was raped in Delhi after December uh, 2012 incident. The police officer refused to register the case, tried to bribe the family, and at the end of the day, nothing has happened against that police officer. Now, if that's what happens in the heart of Delhi, you can expect, actu actually expect what happens in uh, Mofusil areas, in the rural areas. I mean, what I'm trying to say is that all the security forces anywhere in the world, they will actually commit offenses. What makes a society different from the other is the accountability mechanism you have. When the state itself actually creates obstacles to establish accountability, then where can you go? And you are saying that there are forces who are being demoralized. And I am saying, I mean, India had one of the best records in the UN peacekeeping operations. But we have a report from the UN Internal Oversight Services where our security forces committed rape in Demo Democratic Republic of Congo. And the present chief of the army staff was the deputy force commanders there. So it's not a question of being demoralizing somebody. It's a question of accountability. It doesn't matter whoever 
that person and whatever position he or she holds. Once somebody is accused of, it's for the judiciary to decide whether the case is false, vexatious, or whatever. It's not for the administration to say that you know these are false. It's not for him or for me to say. It's for the judges to decide. And that process is being prevented because the security forces cannot be prosecuted. Okay, Aisha wants to say something. Yeah, I mean, I think going back to the question with, with regards to whether the death penalty is effective, and I've listened to the discussion, which is, you know, very, very important. I think one of the, the key points that hasn't been highlighted is the low conviction rates for rape cases, um, not only in India, but across the world. And I think what we need to do, we need to be looking at, you know, why are cases, rape, why is there such a low conviction rate for rape? And, and why is there such a high level of attrition? And what needs to be done from the way the police collect evidence, the way in which victims are treated and responded to in re and how they're processed through the criminal justice system, and subsequently the, the role of the judiciary as well. And um, even in the Nabaya case, although it took nine months to get uh, a verdict, it w it, it, even though it was in a fast track court in Sakit, it still took nine months. Now, as, as the learned friend has also stated, there are many, many backlog of cases, some which actually date back to the 1970s, which have yet to, uh, to be concluded. So what hope, what um, confidence does this give uh, t for victims in terms of coming forward. And I think that's where our argument needs to be focused on. Okay, I'd like to interrupt you there, if I may, and pose this question to T.R. Kaka. I mean, clearly more needs to be done than just changing the law. The view of how women are perceived in the country needs to be changed. What we really need to do in this country is sensitizing our population against such crimes to when the crime is committed all agencies need to speed up particularly the courts because you know let me let me tell you what is the system in, in india that the police has to file the charge sheet in the court of law within 90 days and invariably in practically 90 percent of the cases these charge sheets, if there is a substance, they are filed. They but are doesn't after this the problem case, start before the charge court. sheet is even filed? It is filed and then it lingers on in the courts. We have to speed up our trial process. Too many adjournments at flimsy grounds and all that have to be avoided. That is why cases take very, very long. I think the Supreme Court of India is also now woken up and they are probably trying to come out with something to say that crimes of this nature, they are, they are going to appoint special courts. They are also going, probably trying to lay down some time limit within which cases must be disposed of. Okay. And that perhaps Can I jump in here, if you don't mind? I'd like to give the last word to Suhas. I mean, you must be pretty worried as a man. Every time a woman you know goes out at night, are you concerned? Are you worried about their safety? No, absolutely. I think even in Delhi, I mean, it's so insecure and unsafe. I mean, even to let even your family members to go out. It's for everybody, and that includes Mr. Kakar. I think what India needs to invest, apart from what both Mr. Kakar and the lady had said, is that it needs to invest in judiciary. In the last five-year plan, the government of India had sanctioned about 5,000 million rupees for the judiciary. And that's peanuts. And almost it's one lakh forty five thousand crores we are spent for the defense. Now if you do not give enough systematic support to the judges, if you do not employ enough judges, now the cases will obviously piling up. In Delhi it's slightly better, it has improved in the last two years at the trial courts. But if you go throughout India, I mean the judicial system has no resources to function. And the problem is nobody in the government, irrespective of whichever political party comes to power, they do not want to invest in an effective judiciary. For the judiciary to delay the cases, it suits everybody. So and that's a problem. I'm afraid and unless we resolve the problem. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Sadly, we've run out of time. I think we need a lot more time for this story. Suhas Chakma, thank you very much. Aisha Gill and Tiar Kaka, thank you very much. Thank that was very you. interesting. Don't forget, you can find this story, many others, at aljazeera.com. If you want to find out more, just follow the links for shows and inside story. I'm Jane Dutton. Thanks for watching. Goodbye for now.